Hello, welcome to your lecture on sleep apnea. When we talk about sleep apnea, we're talking about uh, obstructive sleep apnea, so that's OSA. It's a repetitive airway obstruction while sleeping. It's characterized by vigorous respiratory efforts, usually loud snoring and lack of air movement through the pharynx or hypopharynx. There are disruptions of normal sleep architecture. There's frequent arousals during the night. There's cyclic oxygen desaturation. There's carbon dioxide retention. All of these are caused by repeated episodes of underbreathing or complete cessation of breathing, which is where the apnea comes in. Lots of times this will contribute to excessive daytime sleepiness. Often there are going to be impairments in concentration, mood, or work performance. And with kids, we see a difference uh, at school as well as a difference in their behaviors. Now, there are different criteria to diagnose mild, moderate, and severe. I'm going to give you those, but I think the main focus that I would want you to know in this particular lecture would be to how to look at someone and get a pretty good idea that maybe it would be a problem for them and start to ask some questions. Uh, especially if they come in with fatigue, which is a very common complaint. It just gives you a place to start and a way to just recognize um, who to screen. So there are a lot of different criteria. There's a lot of different cutoffs. The ones I think that are most commonly used would be mild sleep apnea has been defined as the number of apneic or hypoapneic events um, of 5 to 15 per hour. Now for moderate, you would have 15 to 30 events per hour, and severe, you would have greater than 30 events. Why it's important for us to talk about the classification is that you may treat the patient completely differently based on the severity. So if you have someone with severe sleep apnea, that's going to be affecting their overall health in a much greater way. So you may not be able to just concentrate on efforts of weight loss. You may have to be doing the CPAP in between, which would help give them enough inner energy to then work on weight loss with you. So there's going to be different ways of treating based on how severe it is. So the key points, obstructive sleep apnea is very much underdiagnosed. The diagnosis is made by polysomnography, which is the sleep study. In obese patients, OSA sometimes is resolved with weight loss. In children, airway obstruction is going to be most common, so you're going to look at their tonsils and check for rhinitis. CPAP is going to be your first line of treatment for moderate to severe OSA. With respect to breathing and, uh, and the underlying pathogenesis of sleep apnea, the patency of the upper airway really depends on a balance of forces. Forces that promote airway collapse and opposing forces that maintain upper airway patency. It's actually a pretty complicated system and I decided not to get too in-depth with that. Forces promoting airway collapse include the negative pressure ventilation and extraluminal positive pressure imposed by factors such as adipose uh, deposits in the soft tissue of the upper airway, fluid, obstructive lesions of the upper airway, such as tonsillar hypertrophy, and small mandibular size. And that's why the craniofacial abnormalities make a difference, and that's why it makes a difference in certain races, and it's just because of the way that their faces are, are made. Upper airway lumen cross-sectional area also decreases somewhat during sleep because of the loss of the tracheal tug. And that happens when your lung volume falls, when you are in a recumbent position. So it's all pretty complicated, but that's your basic pathophysiology, which leads to how do we diagnose it, which leads to how do we treat it. It's really hard to know about the epidemiology when you have a disease process where 70 to 80 percent of it's undiagnosed. So that's kind of what we're going with. Some sources are going to say it's men seven to ten times more common than women. Most sources uh, that I found say it's somewhere around three to one, which is probably more likely. But we don't know that for sure, and that's why I have the question mark on the slide. 
and the reason that we don't know that is we really think it may be un underdiagnosed more often in women because men and women present differently. So if you have a male patient with sleep apnea, they are going to present with the more common types of things like excessive daytime sleepiness, unrefreshing sleep, loud snoring, those kinds of things. But women are more likely to report that they have daytime fatigue, that they have morning headaches, and that they have mood disturbances, which makes it much harder to diagnose. Children, they say it happens in approximately 2 to 4%. It's usually recognized pretty early on, and lots of times if they have um, tonsils removed, um, it makes a big difference and um, helps treat it. It's most common in middle age. As a matter of fact, over the age of 65, it's not very common. So when we say middle age, we mean up to 65, which really makes me feel good. Uh, it's most common in women once they ha are postmenopausal. And they've been looking for a hormone link to that, and it hasn't really been found, but they've been studying it. Like, why does this happen to women postmenopausal? We really don't know. We also know there is a genetic uh, link, and some of that is going to be associated with what I discussed earlier with structural anomalies of the face, but also just more common in certain um, cultures. I don't mean cultures. I mean races, I guess. So African, Asian uh, are going to have uh, more issues. Not that that's abnormal. It's just a difference in the shape. When it comes to subjective data, it's going to be a little bit different than in adults and children. Just like the most prominent cause is different in adults and children. With adults, you're going to, snoring is probably going to be the main thing. They may not recognize it, but oftentimes it will be loud enough to wake them up. But it's most often reported by the patient's sleep partner. They may have choking episodes during sleep. They may have um, unrefreshing sleep. Women are more likely to have the early morning headaches. Uh, dozing during the day is very common, even to the point that there are uh, automobile accidents, uh, work performance issues, those sorts of things. Some adults, they'll have some nocturia, and many will have a mood disturbance, although women are more likely to report that. With children, you're going to have loud snoring. You're going to notice difficulty breathing while they're asleep. They have some issues with enuresis or bedwetting. They usually have school performance issues, and that's due to poor attention. I know how I am when I haven't slept. I'm in a bad mood. I can't pay attention. I'm tired. And actually, I didn't get a lot of sleep last night, so this lecture is going kind of tough for me. They have behavior issues. You know what a kid's like when they don't get their nap. Well, how would you like them to not get any sleep for weeks or months at a time? Yeah, they're not so pleasant. Mood disturbances. They may have night terrors. They have a dry mouth lots of times, and we're going to talk about some of this may be allergy related types of things. They have restless sleep and they have daytime sleepiness. So they may be watching TV, everybody else will be engaged and they fall asleep. Looking at objective data, the first thing for adults and children is looking for obesity. With adults, um, the more that their body mass increases, the more likely they are to have problems with sleep apnea. So almost all of the people that we diagnose with sleep apnea are going to be overweight. Not everyone, because there are other structural abnormalities that make it more likely that they will have problems. Often they'll have a large neck, and often they'll have a crowded pharynx. Now, after the age of 12, your tonsils should start to recede. So when you look at the throat or pharynx of an adult, most of the time you're not going to notice any tonsils. Now, Sometimes you see very large tonsils and you actually wonder how they can breathe through that and you start asking some questions. Uh, I usually ask um, if they ever get food caught in them, if they have problems with bad breath, if they snore, if they have problems with frequent strep infections. And remember the most time that we, look, we are going to look in there is when they complain of a sore throat so the tonsils are going to be enlarged anyway. So those are the things that make you uh, think about referral of an adult for a tonsillectomy. 
Lots of times they'll also have hypertension. With children, it's obesity or it could be failure to thrive. Many times we diagnose this very early on in children and that's because they have issues that are severe early on and it may actually impact their ability uh, to have intake. They have enlarged tonsils, they may have overcrowding of their teeth, they may have uh, evidence of chronic nasal congestion such as mouth breathing. Usually mouth breathers will also have a, a little bit of an odor to their breath and it's kind of distinctive so you can pick up on that. They may have a speech that is nasally and they may also have a very high arch palate. You also want to look for evidence of allergies and you can check their skin for eczema and also think about allergic rhinitis so make sure that you look at the mucosa of the nose. You want to think about the cardiorespiratory system, so you want to think about chest wall deformities. Those are actually pretty common. I know you learned about those in health assessment. You also want to think about the facial features that are common to certain races, or you know, just notice if someone has uh, an issue with their face that would make it more likely that they would have some obstruction. These, um, when talking about objective, are not going to be things that are really going to jump out at you unless you kind of have it in the back of your mind. Um, we are not diagnosing this up to 80% of the time. So knowing about it, learning about it, helps put it on your differential diagnosis. And that increases your ability to diagnose. Okay, when it comes to diagnostics, it's really going to depend a lot on the comorbid conditions. Like we're going to see a patient that has um, most likely obesity, which means that they are at risk for diabetes, they may be hypothyroid. So all of those things are currently being studied in conjunction with a sleep apnea. Another huge area of study is um, cardiovascular effects of uh, OSA. So there's a lot of stuff out there. but So it would be easy to kind of, if you're still searching through your doc, you know, differentials, to do more than you need to. But when it comes to OSA, if I ask you this on a test, um, I would want you to know that the sleep study, the polysomnography, is how you diagnose it. Now in practice, it may help you to do uh, a sleepiness scale I think there are probably several of those out there. The source that I looked at uh, recommended this particular scale. I think it would help you educate the patient that maybe they needed further diagnostics. You could think about a TSH just because if someone is hypothyroid, if it was very severe, they might have sleep apnea, so that's recommended. When I can think about a TSH being extremely relevant in this situation is that if they have Down syndrome, that is a risk factor for sleep apnea. It is also a significant risk factor for hypothyroid. So if I had someone with Downs, TSH would be the first thing that I would think of. In a middle-aged woman, yeah, maybe. I would think of that, especially if they had any other problems like diabetes or family history of thyroid, those kinds of things. Yeah, check it. Would I say check it on everybody? No, probably not. Uh, CBC, here looking for a polycythemia, and again, they need to have a risk factor for that. You know, do they have COPD? What else is going on with them to make you think about actually getting that? The big thing that you need to know is that whenever you get a diagnostic, you can't shotgun, so you can't just throw out and get all the stuff, and that's probably what you've seen a lot. We don't do that, so you need to have a good reason for what diagnostic that you choose, and it needs to be um, helping you with your differential diagnosis, ruling in or ruling out, those sorts of things. The TSH and the CBC would be uh, non really diagnostic of OSA, but they may help you. A nocturnal pulse ox is not an acceptable practice for the diagnosis or screening. So, and I think that's still pretty common. 
Other people also think that you can give them nighttime oxygen and that's going to make a difference and research has shown it has not. Okay, when we talk about treatment for obstructive sleep apnea, of course referral is your main thing, but of course I put weight loss first because I'm a nurse practitioner. Um, you are going to refer them to a sleep specialist. They, you need to because they are most likely going to have CPAP. CPAP is the treatment that they need, but what we know from research is that most people don't use it. It's too uncomfortable. So we don't have really good compliance with it. Now there's a lot of other stuff that's out there like BiPAPs and, and lots of stuff I probably don't even know about but that make it more comfortable. But nothing is going to make it really, really comfortable. And so this is tough with children especially because they do sleep longer and they need to sleep a certain amount of time with the CPAP on. So you can imagine putting this on a two or three year old. I can't anyway. Weight loss may be your treatment because lots of times if they ha get back to a normal weight or the research says at lose at least 10% of their body weight, then their sleep apnea, if it doesn't go away completely, will go back to mild, which is tolerable and won't make as much difference in their day-to-day -day lifestyle. So as always, as nurse practitioners, we're going to think about what are the things that we can do that aren't going to have any negative side effects. And they're also going to help your patient who's most likely obese, who's at risk for diabetes, uh, and the other things that go hypertension, the other things that go with obesity. So even if you do refer to them to a sleep specialist, you need to be as the primary care provider talking with them about weight loss and getting healthy. You may refer them to a dentist. It kind of depends on what you find on your exam. There are treatments that uh, appliances that dentists do although CPAP is your mainstay. You may send them to a surgeon and this is going to be your people who need a tonsillectomy. If they really need a tonsillectomy, nothing else is going to fix them. So you got to make that evaluation and send them uh, to the surgeon for evaluation. Medication. This is something that I see done regularly and it's a big issue. When people come in complaining of daytime fatigue sleepiness, tired, I don't feel well, da da da. You start talking to them about their uh, sleep, I hope. I hope you don't just, you know, jump into a bunch of lab tests. Talk to them about their sleep and they let you know they're not sleeping well. Well, what other people do is they think, oh well I'm going to give them a sedative and that's going to help them sleep. In reality, if you give them a sedative or if they drink alcohol before they go to bed, then it makes their sleep apnea much worse because they have much longer episodes of apnea. So you're trying to help your patient but you're not being very smart about it and you're making the situation much worse and if they have severe sleep apnea you are actually putting your patient in severe danger by giving them things to sedate them and help them sleep. Okay, There are medications that you can give in sleep apnea most of those have to do with trying to treat your daytime sleepiness. So there are medications that you can give just to kind of help wake people up. But those can't be given unless you're also doing the other things. Because just giving them medications to wake them up during the day doesn't help the, the overall picture of what the problem is. And they really have linked sleep apnea to um, many bad outcomes and I didn't spend a lot of time on that but I hope you read the articles and and get a bigger picture of uh, the dangers of sleep apnea and why it's so important that we get better at picking this up.